Welcome to episode 6 of Myth vs. Craft. My guest today is the legendary Mike Campbell. He's a founding member of the Heartbreakers and has been Tom Petty's guitarist and co-captain since 1970. Mike's songwriting and musicianship are fundamental components of the Heartbreakers' sound and success. In addition to his work with Tom Petty, he's collaborated with a who's who list of artists, including Bob Dylan, George Harrison, Roy Orbison, Don Henley, Johnny Cash, Stevie Nicks, and many more. In my opinion, Mike is the most underrated guitarist in rock music. I'm embarrassed to admit that I was guilty of this myself. Though I grew up listening to his music, it wasn't until 2011 that I had my eureka moment about Mike. I was watching TV and came across the soundstage special with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. As I watched them perform, two things hit me. One, it was unbelievable how many great songs this band was playing. Hearing them back to back really hammered home the depth and quality of their catalog. And two, Mike Campbell's guitar playing was as tasteful and impeccable as I'd heard. On every single song, Mike managed to somehow play exactly what the song needed, no more and no less. My admiration for him went through the roof that night, and as you can imagine, I was thrilled when he agreed to be a guest on this show. I spoke with Mike a few days after he played a fundraiser for the Tazzy Animal Rescue Fund. Tazzy is a phenomenal nonprofit that rescues dogs, gets them medical attention, and helps them find good homes. This year, they started rescuing dogs from shelters and training them to be placed with veterans suffering from PTSD, a physical injury, or simply in need of the companionship that only a dog can provide. I hope you find a moment to visit their website at tazzyfun.com, where Tazzy is spelled T-A-Z-Z-Y, and consider making a donation to rescue dogs and help veterans get back on their feet. Here's my conversation with Mike. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. I uh, read that your father was a big fan of Elvis and Johnny Cash, so uh, I figured you must have heard a lot of Scotty Moore and, and Luther Perkins playing guitar. Um, I have the impression that music uh, moved your father very deeply. Did you pick up on this at the time, how, how deeply music affected your father? Uh, yes, I did pick up on it. My dad was in the Air Force, and he had two favorite artists. It was Elvis and Johnny Cash. And he would come home from his uh, shift and he'd put one of those records on, lay on the couch and zone out till the record was over. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, he's, there must be something to this for him to be so tuned into it. And I asked him one day, I said, what do you like so much about Johnny Cash? And he goes, because he tells the truth and he's real, you know. So I those records were always on in, in, in my childhood in the background. So I, I did hear a lot of Luther Perkins and Scotty Moore and I... I was very uh, inspired by that. Uh, you grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Outside of the music that you were listening to at home, uh, what was the music scene like in Jacksonville? What else were you were you around growing up? Well, I actually I grew I was in Jacksonville from eighth grade on. Earlier than that, I lived in Orlando, uh, but Jacksonville was where I went to high school, and uh, there were there were some places to see bands. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't have enough money at the time to go to go out to see bands too often, but I do remember seeing a band called the One Percent. They were playing downtown, and a friend of mine took me to see them. It turned out they, it was uh, a band that Dickie Betts and uh, Barry Oakley had before the uh, uh, Alma Brothers. And so, um, but mostly I just saw bands around. You know, would play at the high school and stuff that were close to my house. And, uh, and, you know, there's the occasional jug band that I would see. Or uh, I remember going uh, when I was, you know, I guess in junior high or high school. There, it was interesting back then in the South. There would be, uh, I remember once I was at my grandparents' house and I walked up the street and there was a gas station. And they were doing some kind of grand opening promo. And on, on the roof of the gas station, they had a blues band. And they weren't anybody that I know who they were, just some... Uh, some black guys that were up on the roof playing, and I was pretty impressed by that. 73 million people saw the Beatles' first live performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, and I can't think of another event that triggered so many musical careers. Um, I think you had just turned 14 when the show aired. Do you remember watching it? Absolutely. I'm, I'm of that generation. It was. We were talking about this the other day uh, with, at the rehearsal, that what a phenomenon that was. Um, and it was interesting because it changed everything overnight in the sense of, like in my high school in Florida, 
before the Beatles happened, uh, there was the greasers who had hot rods and, and put their cigarettes in their t-shirt sleeve <laughs> and greased their hair back and carried blades, you know. <laughs> and they intimidated everybody, and they got all the the cool girls, you know. The Beatles came on TV. The next day I went to school, and it's like half of the guys that weren't greasers who were, you know, used to be geeks now had their hair down like the Beatles, <laughs> and the girls liked them. <laughs> and so, of course, this pissed the other guys off, and it was a bit of awkward for a while there while they accepted that their time had come and gone. And uh, it just the whole culture, you know, people started dressing differently and thinking differently and... Of course, musically, everything just changed. They would have, I used to listen to the top 10 AM hits, you know, and the Beatles had like six songs, you know, six through one was the Beatles, you know, it's like, wow. they just took over. And it was such an amazing thing. Uh, it's hard to describe if you weren't there, but it really went, it was like the world went from black and white to color overnight. <laughs> uh, if you were uh, you were 14 when it aired, I believe you didn't start playing guitar for another couple of years until you were 16. Is that right? You're right. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, we, my family used to watch the Ed Sullivan show and it was usually a singer would come out and stand with the microphone and you would never see the orchestra. They were behind the wall somewhere. And the Beatles came on and, and I was just looking at them as a kid, just going like, there's no musicians behind the curtain. Those four guys are doing everything. They're playing the bass, they're singing, they're playing the guitars, and they got the drums right there, and they do it all, just the four of them. And I thought, of course, you know, that's, that, that looks like a, a great job to have, you know. <laughs> so once you started playing at, uh, at age 16, did it, uh, was it pretty much, did it pretty much become an all-encompassing activity from that point onward, or, or was it a gradual thing where you had other interests, and, and over time it became the, you know, your primary activity and primary focus, or was it from the get-go that it just consumed you? It pretty well consumed me. <clears throat> I mean, I wanted a guitar really bad, and I we didn't have a lot of money, so my mom managed to get me a, a pawn shop guitar for fifteen bucks. And it was—I didn't know at the time that it was basically unplayable because the strings <laughs> were so high off the neck. But I just thought, well, that's that's the way guitars are. And I would be try to play that thing, you know, and I would listen to records and try to copy the records and think, like, how do these guys do that? You know, like my guitar, and my fingers would literally bleed. I have to stop. Well. You know, I'm done with guitar today because my fingers are bleeding. I can't push the strings down anymore. And it, it just kind of took, yeah, once, but once I was obsessed with the guitar, everything else, like I used to, you know, would play Sandlot basketball or go out with my buddies and, and play sports or whatever, that all stopped. And it was go home, get the guitar, get the records, and zone into that, you know. I believe you moved to, to Gainesville to attend the University of Florida and you applied to the music program, but at the time they, they didn't like the fact that you didn't have formal training. Um, did you apply to the music program because at that point you already knew that you wanted a career in music? Well, you've done your homework, uh, but you're right. I, um, I got a scholarship and loan through the Air Force. My dad was in the Air Force to go to college and um, I was picking out my classes and so, you know, you, have, you were required to take, you know, English and literature and all that. And then for my electives, I thought, well, you know, I want to take some music, you know. But I hadn't had any formal training. I'd just been teaching myself. So I went into the music department and they just said, no, -uh, you know, you're not qualified for this. So I took, I ended up taking music histories, which was a study of all the composers like Beethoven and Bach. And I loved doing that, just learning their music. And, but I wasn't able to get into the actual music school to play an instrument. I didn't qualify, but I just kept on playing the guitar on my own, you know, with my friends, and uh, eventually things worked out. I believe you formed a three-piece band called Dead or Alive. Was this your first band? Wow. Yeah, you know all kinds of stuff. It was my, <clears throat> well, let me see, the very first time I ever played with a group, it was just a, some friends of mine up in Jacksonville, and we got, <laughs> this is a funny story, we got booked to play a birthday party. And we had just been playing in my garage, you know, just surf songs and a couple of simple things like Louie Louie and stuff like that. And so we got a gig, you know, and I was all excited. We went down and set up our equipment and all. it was like some, you know, pre-teen or, or early teen teenage girls were there. One of them was having her birthday. And so we played a bit and they were kind of grooving on that. And we thought, this is kind of cool. And then one girl showed up and she had a copy of Pet Sounds that she had just bought. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she put the record on and our gig was pretty much over. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. So would you, uh, 
why do you think it was that, uh, I guess you were in Jacksonville, uh, you know, from the time you started playing 16, 17, you, you might've moved to Gainesville at 17 or 18. Uh, why do you think that you didn't play more in bands in Jacksonville and it wasn't until you got to Gainesville? Were you, were you just focused on getting better at the instrument that you just not come across other people or the, the opportunities not arise to play in a band? Well, it was just something that was, what more is a poor boy going to do but play in a rock and roll band? I mean, there was nothing else that was exciting. And I wasn't. I, I found once I started playing the guitar that I had a, 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 a talent of some sort for it. And I was just like drawn to it. And I noticed that when I would sit down and play around other people, they'd want to be my friend. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, I, I just knew I'd found my thing, you know. And so I just, you know, my whole life was the guitar and, and the dream of trying to get a band someday. I mean, I didn't think way ahead, you know, other than a few weeks at a time, but I just knew I loved it and I was going to do it no matter what, you know. Warren Zanes wrote in, in his biography of Tom Petty that uh, that you were very shy, were you? Yeah, I was I was pretty introverted at the time. I don't know why, but that's a job for a therapist, I guess. But I was just shy and uh, introverted, I guess. But the music gave me confidence, finding something that I could do that made me feel good about myself, and it kind of brought me out of my shell. Tom Petty famously convinced you to... Uh, to leave the University of Florida to join Mudcrutch full time, um, do you recall if that was a tough decision for you or, or just a slam dunk? Well, no, I was. I had. Well, getting back to your other question, which I didn't finish, when I went to Gainesville, I did hook up with Randall Marsh and a friend of mine who plays bass, and we started a little band, like a blues jam band, called Dead or Alive, and we would play the college. Gainesville was great at the time; they would have gigs at the college behind the student union on the lawn or whatever. And any band he could get up and play, and we would play a lot of those. And um, then that fell apart, and I saw an ad of a... I had seen Mud Crutch, which was like a country rock band, and Tom was playing bass at the time, I think. And I saw an ad at the studio union. They were looking for a drummer, and my drummer from Dead or Alive was living with me. So I said, you know, you should audition for these guys. I saw them, and they're pretty good. And they came out to the house where you're renting and set up to audition Randall. Turns out they needed a guitar player, so he said, well, there's a guy in the back. And so I came out and played a few songs with them, and we've been playing together ever since. Was it Chuck Berry that, that you played for them and impressed them with? Yeah. Yeah, I could play. I, I, I tuned into Chuck Berry pretty good when I was learning, and I could play that stuff pretty well. And I think when they saw me, I had short hair. They thought, oh, great, you know, here's this, you know, weirdo. And then I played the guitar, and they thought, wait a minute, you know, I've got <laughs> something on the ball. But yeah, it was Chuck Berry, and we might have played Honky Tonk Women or. But I think it was Johnny B. Good, probably the first song we played together, and, and I knew that pretty well, and and they were they seem impressed with that. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was the decision to leave uh, the University of Florida? I mean, for good. Uh, was that a slam dunk decision to leave, or or did you struggle with that decision? I at struggled all? a little, only because of the draft, the military draft. I was in college, and I knew as long as I was in college that I wouldn't get sent to Vietnam which I didn't really believe in, and I didn't want to die in a rice paddy. So I stayed in college to avoid that mostly. And then Tom, bless his heart, he said, well, you know, you've got to join the band. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I've got this this military thing. And he said, well, you know, just just stick with me. We'll figure it out. And uh, <laughs> I went for my physical and failed that. And uh, then I was a free man. And then I just joined the band, quit school. And my dad was a little disappointed. But then when things happened for me, he was really proud. Oh, I can imagine. Now, I read that you admired the the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and and this gave you an appreciation of of shorter songs with great melodies, harmonies, uh, in contrast to some of the uh, longer jams or, or more instrumental uh, music that I might have been prevalent in, in the South at the time. And you know, there's Leonard Skinner, the Almond Brothers. Uh, I also read that you and Tom Leiden, the other guitar player in Mudcrutch, he pronounced were, his name were, Leiden. Oh, Ledden, I pardon me. Yeah. Tom Ledden. Yeah. Uh, we're really into long jams and, and these similar extended instrumentals at the beginning, and you would sometimes uh, push Mudcrutch to make the guitar solos longer. How, how long did it take you to complete the transition into the song-oriented, tasteful playing that you've become so well known for? Well, thank you for the compliment. Um, it was just organic. There was, it was no um, big revelation. It all just happened. I mean, when I joined Mud Crush, like I said, they were kind of a Burrito Brothers type band. And my band that I had just broken up from was more of a jam band. Uh, but when I first started learning guitar, the first things I learned were not jam songs. You know, they were 
the animals, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, you know, pop songs. So I knew all that stuff, but I also had, had fallen in love with Michael Bloomfield and Jimi Hendrix along the way and stuff. So I, I liked to push the guitar a little bit. So when I first got with Mud Crutch, I liked that they had con- concise songs with choruses, you know, and then and it, it, there would be a, a point in the rehearsal where I'd say, well, you know, maybe this song should stretch out a little bit and let the guitar go on for a while. And so they incorporated some of that into their stuff. And then, uh, it was kind of a mix of those two worlds. Touching on song songwriting for a moment, which is a topic that I, I, I tend to dwell on quite a bit with my guests. Um, how, when, and where do musical ideas come to you? Is it always with a guitar in your hands, or does stuff just pop in at all times? Well, I, you picked a subject that's my favorite subject in the world. Um, I am obsessed with songwriting. It is my religion, basically. I do it every day. And um, I'm just always trying to get better. When I when I first started playing guitar, I wasn't really writing that much. I was just learning guitar, you know, learning the scales and bends and all the techniques. And as time went on, I started wanting to, you know, to write songs. Early on, it would I would have to pick up the guitar to channel an idea because it was all around the guitar. And then as I've gotten older, I can go for a walk and write a whole song in my head without the guitar in my hand. And uh, I've just become more astute at at remembering things in my mind without having to have the guitar as a as a crutch to lead me into a song. So I mean, it songs come all different ways. I mean, I'm basically I look I'm a guy who's a 24 hour song awareness. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> like open at any time. Driving the car, walking the dog, wake up in the morning. You know, I could turn on the TV and somebody will say something, I hear something, and I immediately get to turn the TV off and go write that idea that I got. It drives my family crazy a bit, but that's just who I am. I'm, I'm just tuned into it, and I love it. And it, it, it's a, it's. I almost don't like to talk about it too much because it's very spiritual, and I don't want to, you know, ruin the gift. But it is a gift. Ideas just come to you in different ways, you know. And it's, I feel very blessed to have that in my life. Uh, you touch on something, uh, a recent guest on the show, the guitarist uh, David Grissom, uh, said something similar to what you just said, which is that he uh, sometimes he has difficulty going to the movies or or, yeah. or watching a movie and that he, he finds himself just kind of going on a side adventure where he, he starts it just starts triggering musical ideas and someone asks him about you know such and such scene after the movie and he just doesn't remember because he just went on this parallel right. adventure. You know, that's what it's like. I heard a story once that I can relate to. It's about Leonard Bernstein, and uh, who was a composer, he, you know, West Side Story and tons of other stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the story was he was at a cocktail party with a bunch of important people, and they were standing around having drinks. And somebody came up to talk to him, and and he didn't respond. And his wife said, "No, leave him alone. Can't you see he's writing?" <laughs> <laughs> so it. I mean, I have trouble sometimes listening to music because as soon as I turn it on. Either I hate it or I change it until I find something I like. And if I find something I like, it, it triggers something. And I start thinking, I'm not just enjoying the song that's in front of me. I'm going, oh, that's a cool piece. Oh, that could be some, a cool idea for a song. And then the song's still playing, but I'm already in my head going to the songwriting world. So it's sometimes I have to, it's hard to turn it off. Yeah, it's, it, it kind of takes over your whole brain. I read that you once said about songwriting that you work in bulk. Uh, so meaning that you're very prolific and you're constantly generating material. And you just mentioned that a few moments ago, that you write every single day. What do you do with most of the material that you write? Do you catalog it? Do you store it? Do you save it? Do you share it? Well, that's a good question. I do catalog it, and I've gotten better at that over the years. Um, and I do write a lot. I try to, to keep a high bar, but you know, not everything you write is a masterpiece at the time you might think it is but i I, uh, I write a lot and then i review what i've done and i trim out the bad shit and try to focus on the pieces that that hold up and then i catalog them i'm keeping them i, re- I have a studio in my house so if i get i record stuff that i that i think of and then uh, the recordings are really good and so i just uh, my main job and, and with the heartbreakers is is if we're doing a record, I bring in what and, you know the best ideas I have at that time, and give them to Tom. And uh, if he hears something he likes, they become songs for the Heartbreakers. And the stuff that he doesn't use, 
I either go, well, he's right, that was a piece of shit, and throw it away, or I go, nah, it's pretty good. It's not right for him, but it's still a good song. I'm going to put this over in my category of lost songs. But I'm keeping them, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep only the good stuff and keep it cataloged and earmarked, so at some point in the future, you know, I'll do something with them. Having been so prolific over so many decades, how do you avoid repeating yourself? Is it Does it just come naturally, or do you make a concerted effort to avoid repetition? Well, you're bound to repeat yourself. If you write a lot, you're bound to fall into a, you know, something similar to what you've already done. But I found that it's best not to think about that when you're in the in the moment, because if you start imposing too many rules on the muse, it'll drift away. So I I do that. I will just write. I don't worry about if it's if it sounds similar to something else at the time. I might it might cross my mind a little bit. Oh, that's a little bit of like this, and I might change it slightly. But I try not to get into that frame of mind. I try to just let the thing come out. And then when I review it and listen back to it, I go, well, I can't use that because it's too much like this or that. Or I can maybe I should go and change this part or whatever. And then I edit it if I want to. But I remember George Harrison um, was talking to us once about that. And, you know, he, he got sued for that. He's so fine, um, My Sweet Lord song, which was just a subliminal accident that his song was similar to that song. And he went through a thing where, because he got sued, and it was a miserable experience, that, where it would shut down his muse because he'd be afraid to write something because it might be somebody else's song he'd get sued for. And then he had to get work through that to get past it. So I don't want to get blocked because of you know being worried about that sort of stuff. You have to let the flow come. And then, you know, if it's shit, you throw it out. And if it's similar to something else, then you'd make a change. Uh, there was a song once that uh, Jeff Lynn brought in on uh, Great White Open called Out in the Cold, a song that he and Tom wrote together. And we finished the whole song, and he came in the next day, he goes, we've got to change that chord. I said, why? Well, it's like this other song you hear on the radio. So we've got to change that one chord. So we went in, got all the instruments up, got the sounds back, and dropped in that one chord every time it came around to change it. <laughs> And I think that's the best way to go. Just, you know, follow the inspiration in the moment and then review it and then make decisions about it. Did changing that one chord suffice to make it yeah, different yeah, enough? Yeah, it, it took it out of lawsuit mode. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't think it was a big deal, but it was he was worried about it, so we did it. And so now I've learned, you know, sometimes I'll do that with my stuff. You know, I'll have a song that's finished and I'll hear it. And I'll go, oh, no, I know where. You know what happens too sometimes is I'll get an idea and I'll think this is the greatest thing ever, you know. And I'll go and start working on it, and then I'll turn on the radio or something. And be, oh no, it's a kink song. It's that <laughs> kink song that I love so much, and it was in the back of my mind, and, and I just channeled it, and I have to throw it out, you know. So that happens. All those things happen. But you know, if you just maybe for me working in bulk, if you know, if you write ten songs and throw eight of them out, maybe one or two are good. It was worth it, you know. Do you find that most of what you write falls? Um... Uh, along the same vein uh, stylistically, or do you do you find yourself drifting and exploring uh, different genres or, or or different styles of music? That's a good question. I do get out of my comfort zone with, stylistically, especially if I'm working in my own in my own studio. I have the freedom of doing whatever I want. Nobody can hear it except me. And I try different, you know, poppy stuff and bluesy stuff and this and that. But I found over time that the stuff that sounds more pure and true to me is not the poppy stuff. Occasionally one will pop up, but most of those, when I write them, I listen to them back and go, you know, that's, I'm not feeling that as strong, but the bluesier stuff and the stuff that's got a little more rock and roll and edge to it, that seems to, to ring more true to me for, for myself. What about lyrically? Uh, you've had the opportunity to work with great lyricists, um, Tom Petty, um, Don Henley, uh, and I'm sure many, many Bob more. Bob <laughs> <laughs> there any better than that yeah <laughs> so what about your own lyrics is that something you find uh um that you struggle with or is it something that comes as fluently as you know as the I, used writing to. Of the music? I used to have a a, a a huge struggle with lyrics but lately the like the last five ten years it's starting to come a lot more easier to me and i don't know why maybe i'm just older or, or less uptight but um i love writing lyrics and I love stringing words together. And um, you know, so occasionally Tom will use some of the lyrics I have, but I always usually prefer to have him write his own words. But occasionally he'll use a piece that he liked that I did. But in my own songs, the words are really 
not that much of a challenge. Um, once you get into the mode and you're open, it just kind of comes. And the thing I love about words, I mean, the English language is a fascinating language. There's so many different words and rhyme schemes and setups that you can do. And what amazes me is you can start a song and have a general idea and then flesh it out, you know, to, you know with how many verses or choruses or bridge, whatever you need. And then maybe it's it's like 80% good, you know, but there's something that, that you just can't quite put your finger on. And sometimes you can go in and just change one word in the punchline, and the whole thing will just step up to 100% great. It's it's incredible mm-hmm. that way. And that's, those little revelations are, are really exciting. When did you start singing? At what age? Oh, I didn't. I was like, like uh, you mentioned before. I, I was kind of too shy to sing, and then when I I got with Tom, I think I was probably pretty intimidated. So I didn't really try to sing much. Uh, but then over the years, when I got my own studio and I could actually mess around without anybody hearing me, I kind of got into enjoying it. And then I got this little club band called the Dirty Knobs, and we went out, we go out and play bars and things, and I'm I'm the singer in that band. But um, singing, I mean, I'm not like uh, Caruso or anything, but I did. I have learned how to get the personality and the attitude across, and I can get, you know, I'm, I'm, my pitch is getting better, so I can I can do stuff that works for me, you know. Do you feel like once you got comfortable singing, that it changed your guitar playing in any way, or was it already was your guitar playing already so mature that it wasn't about to be influenced by the way you sang? Um. <clears throat> I don't know if it's changed my guitar playing. I do have a lot more respect for lyricists that I've worked with, having done my own lyrics and realizing what a challenge it can be. I have a much more compassion for Tom when he's struggling with a word, or I can understand that now. So I have a you know more mature idea about those things. But um, the guitar, I mean, when I if, if I'm writing, I, many times I'll write with an acoustic guitar and flesh out the words and the, the structure and everything. But I know in the back of my mind that when I record this, the guitar can really bring these words out. There's certain things I'll be able to do with the guitar because that's what I mainly do is is try to you know bring songs up with the right parts and, and flow and this and that. So I know I've got that in my back pocket that maybe even if this song isn't great, <laughs> the guitar's on it, it's going to sound better, you know? I'm uh, I'm intrigued by the idea of of natural talent, um, and in some arenas, for example, sports, it can be very self evident. You can either run very fast or jump very high, or you cannot. Um, you've collaborated with an innumerable number of great musicians, and you've also played with many of the same musicians for forty plus years. In your experience, has it always been abundantly clear when some people just have it from the get go, and others just don't, or have you noticed people get uh, improved? noticeably and get there through sheer hard work over time well both things are true i mean some people are just have the gift they're born with it it's really easy for them but other people you know myself as an example or who are either intimidated or or insecure at the beginning sometimes it takes them longer to get confidence to blossom at a later age but yeah you know certain people you know bob dylan john lennon people like that they're just born with this amazing gift. Uh, Roy Orbison, uh, we worked with a while back, and I remember he said once, he said, I knew when I opened my mouth that I had a great voice. You know, God gave me this great voice, and I just accepted that. That's my gift, you know. <laughs> and um, like Tom, for instance, is brilliant with songs and, and simplicity and directness. And he, he he's pretty impressive. If you're, I'm in the studio sometimes, he'll come in and, he may have just a, a very rough fragment of a song and maybe only a couple of lyrics. And we'll start playing and he'll start making lyrics up on the spot that are really good. You know, and he'll set up a rhyme. And I know he hasn't thought this out, but when the rhyme comes around, he'll hit the word. And I know it just came to him in that instant because he just has that gift, you know. So I think it's all things. Some people it's really easy for, and other people can work for it. But I mean, if you get there, you get there, whichever way you get there. In in that same context, um, the idea of artistic evolution or growth is also something that that's interesting to me. And um, my last guest on the show was a, a a British blues guitar player, Matt Schofield, and we started talking about 
artistic evolution and growth in the context of blues music and how uh, paradoxical that can be in that there's there's finite bounds beyond which you're not expected to 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 reach uh, yet at the same time you you want to continue growing and it seems like that often takes the form of refinement and uh, and we talked about the uh, famous da Vinci quote where he you know in terms of simplicity being the the ultimate form of sophistication and striving towards that and I'm wondering if in your career if you feel like that is accurate has your growth been really a form of refinement over time as opposed to necessarily change oh that's really interesting um, simplicity is is the key. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, and uh, there was a point, like when I started out, I uh, started learning, and then I got to a point where I thought, well, I'm better than most of my friends, so I'm pretty good. And then I, and when I got going and got into a band, and like once I, once I really got rolling, I was pretty much, in, to, on, in some extent, to some extent, as good as I was going to get, you know, I got there, and I could do it, and um, then as the years went on, I mean, I'm not going to veer off into jazz or fusion or something. So I, my, my approach has been to, ref, like you said, refine the nuances of what you've already accomplished and try to just do them better and more consistently without going too far out. I mean, you know, there's, you could talk about really sim- simplistic music, but then you've got people like Jimi Hendrix talk about the blues who took it to a whole other level. You know, well, I'm not Jimi Hendrix, but uh, I can appreciate stretching the blues as far as it can go. I mean, the blues is an undercurrent of rock and roll music, you know, the, the notes and the feeling and the spirituality of it. And um, it's good to have that in your soul, when whatever you're doing. In terms of performing, would you say that you enjoy performing as much and in the same way? that you used to back when you first started playing with Mud Crutch, or has that changed somehow? No, I still enjoy it just as much, uh, maybe more because I I cherish it, and I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do it. But, um, yeah, when there's nothing like it. I mean, when you set up with a band, whether you're at rehearsal or live, and you and you count that off and you all go on this ride together, it's uh, that never gets old. It's always like this exciting kinetic experience. I've had a, a few guests uh, touch on, uh, I found a pattern in what they've described, which is that they can be in the worst possible mood and just really, really down. And within four bars of of, of playing with their band, it just kind of cleanses them and it brings them, it, it resets them. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, I don't know if you play in a band, but if you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. There's just something really spiritual about it. Now, the other thing about, you know, you talk about playing live. I mean, what does get old is, is the hard traveling. Like when you're young, when we were young, you know, we traveled around in, in vans and did, you know, 10-hour drives in the back of a van. And it was great. It was romantic and exciting. And But I wouldn't want to do that now. You know, I'm not into the hard road experience. But once you get to the gig, you know, it, it's all good. Uh, you mentioned your side band, the the Dirty Knobs. How, how do you feel when you play the smaller clubs in, in such a different context from from the sort of places you play with the Heartbreakers? It's a well, the, the Dirty Knobs is an experience that I cannot get with the Heartbreakers, and vice versa. With the Dirty Knobs, we're not going to go out and play any hits that have been on the radio, and we're, we're going to play songs maybe that we just wrote that week. It's mostly me. I write the songs, and then we go out and, and play them. And some, you know, it's it's a, it's a good workshop for new songs to see how they fly live. But with the Dirty Knobs, it's um, there's no set list of hits that we're required to play. So we can do whatever we want. And if we have a song that we want the the ending to go on or the middle to go on for three or four minutes and see where it takes us, we have the freedom to do that. We can't really do that with the Heartbreakers because the Heartbreakers gigs are are scripted to a point because there's a paid audience that is expecting and, and deserves to hear the songs that they've grown accustomed to. So we keep the experimental, spontaneous stuff to a minimum with that group. But with the knobs, it's, it's I mean, it's equally fulfilling because it's a, a channel that I don't get to turn on 
with the Heartbreakers, and I'm able to. Plus, it's my band, so I can I can lead lead the charge any direction I want to go, which is a different um, mindset than being a uh, in a, a guitar player in the Heartbreakers, which I'm basically following Tom's charge and, and making that uh, enhancing that in the best I can. So there's times at Dirty Knobs gigs where we're playing and things happen that we did not rehearse that are like amazing. And we get to the end of it and we go, how did we do that? You know, <laughs> but you can't really do that if you're not brave enough and have, you know, the, the form to allow you to do that. So that's the main draw of the, of the knobs is that freedom. Do you ever wish that the Heartbreakers did have a bit more of that freedom, or or is it just right as is, and the Dirty Knobs gives you fills that need just right? I think it's a good balance. I mean, the Heartbreakers, we do have those moments, and we have, uh, I think, over the last you know five or ten years, we have had more of that in our show, and allowed for for some spontaneity, and then of course there's always a couple of hits right after it. To, to play. <laughs> to pull you out if you get stuck in the ditch, but um, it's uh, I don't I don't think the Heartbreakers is that type of band, and I really wouldn't want to change them because I love the way they are. Uh, but there's there's places in the show where we do get a little risky and and take some chances and, and hope for some magic to happen that wasn't scripted. But you know we there's a responsibility to the people that have paid a lot of money and come all the way out there and they want to hear you know. I know if I go to see ACDC and they don't play my favorite songs, I feel like a little let down, you know. So it's, <laughs> it's my job to, to give the people what they want, you know. Speaking of, of bands that you go see, are there uh, uh, are there any bands out there, or could you name a band or two that you, you feel are just outstanding live? Well, I don't go to many concerts anymore because I don't like crowds, and there's not a whole lot of bands that I really want to go through that experience to, to see them live. Um, I guess because I'm getting older, but um, I would go see Neil Young. I would go see ACDC. I'd go see the Stones. I'd go see the Beatles if they were still together. <laughs> uh, but for me to go to a concert, I got, recently I, I, had, I had a great experience here in uh, the Valley in L.A. There's a little uh, club up the street, and Brian Wilson was playing there. Wow. And I went there, and that was just the most amazing night because it was a relatively small place. And he did his whole catalog. I mean, songs that I would have never even dreamed I would hear live. And that was definitely worth the trip. But um, there's not many bands out there that pull me out of my house anymore. <laughs> Over time, would you say that you've become more or less self-critical of your own playing after each show? Uh, more critical. Because I, I know the difference, you know. When I was younger, I just think, well, that was great. You know, they all went crazy and we had a ball. But, but now I'll do a show and I'll go, you know what? I, I missed that. I missed that note. You know, I, I went out of tune there or, you know, I know I can do better than that. And so I, I'm a little more critical now. And in the studio, too, I'm much more critical. Um, I'll do, I don't do it until I get it right, you know. Speaking of the studio... You recorded Full Moon Fever in your garage. I contrast that in my mind with many people's obsession with finding the perfect recording equipment, perfect console, compressors, outboard gear, perfect room treatment, acoustics. Do you think that people tend to get hung up on things that don't matter all that much when it comes to making an album? Yeah, probably a lot of people do because you can get sucked into the, you know, the ear candy stuff. But the truth of the matter is nothing was going to replace a good song. Um, I had a friend, Duck Dunn, who plays bass uh, many years ago, and he came and he overdubbed on a few of our tracks. And we were in the studio one day with the Heartbreakers, and he was there. And we were struggling with the sound and getting all pissy with ourselves. And we were kind of, you know, getting all mental. And he goes, look, guys, I never heard five guys play real good sound bad. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I like a good sound. And getting a good sound is really not that hard once you know, you know how to do it. But it doesn't matter how good it sounds if the song isn't really powerful. Um, so I think maybe I don't know. I'm not going to disparage other artists, but there's a lot of music that I don't listen to because I can, I can hear that they're you know they're working on their sounds and getting off on the echo or whatever it is. But they didn't spend any time on the song. You know? <laughs> 
You've uh, worked and learned for uh, with some great producers, including Jeff Lynn, Jimmy Iovine, uh, Rick Rubin. Have you found an approach uh, that works best for you, maybe an amalgamation of, of things that all of them do? Uh, well, yeah, you learn from everybody. Um, I mean, probably the guy, I mean, I've learned, I learned a lot from Jimmy, who is not a musician, and a lot from Rick Rubin, who is not a musician, about uh, producing from their point of view. Uh, and, but, you know, I've also worked with Jeff Lynn, who I've probably learned more from him than anybody. And he happens to be a musician, so he can explain things and do things that the other guys can't do in the studio. And he he is amazing. I, I've learned a lot from him uh, on how to, you know, get a good sounding track and, and how to arrange a record and and come up with the right parts here and there. And uh, just record making in general, the guy's a, a genius. How capable do you think the audience is of hearing or at least feeling all the subtle differences that you work so hard to get just right in the studio. And I'm referring, for example, to, um, I've read that you recorded dozens and dozens of takes of Refugee. Yeah. And you were just waiting for just the right vibe and you were recording it live. Do you feel, in this, in this hypothetical, if you had gone with take number seven, which clearly at the time you didn't think was adequate, do you think that the majority of your audience would have felt it and maybe they, it wouldn't have felt as right to them? Or, or was it, or were you really doing it because you could hear it, and ultimately you need to be happy with it? Well, you're right. You have to you have to reach your own bar. You know, you set your bar as to what you want to accomplish. And yeah, we could have put out the seventh take, but it wouldn't have been, you know, as good. And some people would have liked it because the song was good. But if you get the song and the sound, the combination then you're going to reach a lot more people, you know, and it's going to, it's going to stand the test of time because if you don't get it right, you're going to, the rest of your life, you'll be going, Oh, that could have been so good. If we could have just, you know, moved the mic around a little bit and got a better sound or sung it again or whatever, you know? So, I mean, the song is the most important thing, but if you, if you, the song deserves the best sound you can get, you know, and if you don't serve the song, then you didn't really do your best. Do you still experiment and tinker much in the studio, or have you found what works for you and you just go with that? Well, no, I experiment all the time. I, the other day, I just got a theremin, a little mini, it's called mm -hmm. a theremini. <laughs> <laughs> I drove my family crazy, but I, I was messing around with it. And with guitars, you know, I, I know, like if I have a song and I, I'm tracking it down, I know I can put, I can do certain guitar things that will sound good. And sometimes I'm happy with that, and other times I go, you know what? I'm going to do something I've never done before, you know, I'll try a different sound or, or, you know, play with two, take, you know, only two strings on the guitar or something crazy to, to force me to, you know, mother is the, you know, the mother of invention, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. But yeah, sometimes it's good to just throw your familiarity out and try to make something happen, you know, or go to a, a little tiny amp and put a microphone on it instead of the big, normal, posh sound, and try to make something happen with that. Uh, that's essential to push yourself. Speaking of equipment, you, you're well known for, and, and Tom as well, for having a great collection of vintage instruments. And I'm wondering if, if you've played many new instruments that have caught your attention, or if you really haven't found anything new, and I'm referring to over the past 10, 20 years, yeah. that, that measures up to some of your favorite instruments. Well, that's a good question, too. The, the truth is, no. Uh, I like the Duesenberg guitars. Of, of all the new guitars I've played, they're the best engineered uh, sounding guitars, and I really do like them a lot, and I use them in all different ways. But any time I, I could take a Duesenberg in the studio and, and mic it up and play it, it'll sound, I can make it sound good. But if I plug in a Telecaster or a Les Paul, it's going to sound better <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know if it's because that's what I'm familiar with there's just some kind of especially the vintage ones there's a mysterious richness to them and I mean some of the new guitars are really close and you get one you think wow this sounds great and you plug in your old guitar and you go oh fuck yeah not, <laughs> but it doesn't sound as good as that you know do you ever have any reservations over taking some of your very valuable and unique vintage gear on tour of course there's there's a handful of guitars that I never take on the road anymore just because I I wouldn't be able to live if I lost them because they're irreplaceable 
59 Les Paul, a broadcaster. I've got a couple that, you know, it's just not worth it to take it out there in the weather or get them broken or dropped by a roadie or stolen. And I treasure them too much, so I keep them safe at home and record with them. We were doing a gig uh, with this band Mud Crutch up in Santa Barbara, and so I took my, my 59 Les Paul up for the gig because I knew I could keep it with me and nothing would happen to it. <laughs> I went to the sound check and plugged it in, and the sound man came running up and he goes, What's that? Why don't, why, where's that sound band? Well, you know, it's been at home <laughs> in my closet. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, guitars are very precious to me, and I wouldn't want to damage something real expensive or valuable. And the truth is, I mean, when I, I got my Les Paul, and then we were going to do a tour, and, and Gibson came, showed up, and they took measurements on my guitar, and, and they made me a clone that's like 95% as good. And I used that on tour. I mean, you can hardly tell the difference in the big arena. But in the studio, you could tell there's like a 5%, you know, or 10% richness to it. Do you recognize your influence and your children's appreciation of music in a way similar to the way your father influenced you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they, uh, you know, they were brainwashed by me growing up. <laughs> but, you know, they like the music that I like as they've grown through their different fads in high school. You know, they all like what their friends liked. But as they've gotten older, they seem to gra- gravitate back toward the stuff that I taught them. I remember once when my, my son was like five years old, I think. We were driving in the car, and I had the FM radio on, and I was just pushing buttons from one song to the next, trying to find something I liked, you know. And so nothing was... I heard, I heard one 60s song that sounded pretty good, but I kept going, and I went past it, and he goes, wait a minute, stop. He goes, go back to... And I went back to... that was the 60s channel, and it, I think it was uh, I Got You, Babe, or something. Uh-huh. And he just goes, why does that sound better than everything else? <laughs> <laughs> At five. Well, I think the truth is, you know, no matter who you are, you can tell there's you can tell the difference, quality, in the song and, and, and everything, you know. And so he was able, even at his age, he was able to pick out, you know, something good in the middle of all this other crap. That's a great story. Are you working on any new projects right now? I uh, well, we just finished a second Mud Crutch album. It's being mixed now, and it's really good. It's a little different than the first one, but uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Tom wrote some great songs. Everybody in in the band sings one song on the album, and so it's got some variety and great playing. Uh, So we've done that. I've got um, the Heartbreakers are reissuing a bunch of stuff for our 40th anniversary, repackaging some things and with some things that were never released. That's going on. I have a project that just came up I'm going to do in January excuse me, with a friend of mine named Marty Stewart, who's a country guy, and he wants me to co-produce his band with him. So I'm looking forward to doing that. But mostly, I just, and if I'm not busy, I just write, you know, and stockpile ideas. Do you know if uh, if the Heartbreakers are likely to go on the road anytime soon? I know we're going to go on the road. I don't know anytime soon. Uh, it depends. Well, if Mud Crutch is going to do any touring, we might do a small tour with them. Mm-hmm. That will take us through next summer because the record won't come out for a few more months. And mm-hmm. so the Heartbreakers most likely will not play next year unless it's late in the year. Mm-hmm. But uh, we de- certainly intend to go out again you know, that, that fall or winter or the next year, which would be 2017, I guess. I've read that ACDC, anytime they get back in the studio, they never get rusty. I mean, they can pick up right where they left off. Are, are the Heartbreakers the same way? You can not play live for a year, year and a half, couple of years, and then when you get back together, it just clicks? Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, when you're preparing for a tour and we haven't played in a while, we get into rehearsal and it's like, it's, it's pretty good. But then it's it's a little, you know, a little uh, skippy here and there. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we so we work on it and refine it a little bit, but it, it, it's you know it's like riding a bike; it comes back pretty quick. And I also I think because I have my other band, I, I stay, I keep my my I hate the word chops, but I keep my myself pretty well rehearsed, you know, and play I play a lot with my other band, and so I'm I don't have a lot of trouble getting my own thing together, but getting the band to gel takes a while to get it where it's ready to go out, you know, but. Yeah, we can walk in if we never haven't played in a year, and it's going to sound pretty good, you know. 
you write a, a lot of music. You stay busy with the Dirty Knobs, uh, with uh, with Mud Crutch, with the Heartbreakers. Uh, you you're collaborating with other musicians, but I I also know that you are involved with a a great cause, which is the Tassie Animal Rescue Fund. Uh, can you tell me a little about how you got involved with that and the type of work that you do? Yes, um, I got involved with it because my wife got involved with it, and she pulled me into it. Uh, we're dog lovers, and my wife has a business called Bow Wow Bungalow in Burbank, where it's like a boarding daycare mm-hmm. dog business. Uh, it's like a Disneyland for dogs. And her, <laughs> her and her partner put together uh, a charity to help people who had uh, medical expenses for their dogs that couldn't afford it, and also to help place dogs that need home in good homes. And uh, this year we've expanded that to include veterans coming back from the wars that either have post-traumatic stress or just lonely or need some grounding and some love to get their life back together. So we try to connect the right dogs with the right person. And it's a great cause. And uh, we just did a, a, a charity at the Troubadour where Tom and Jeff Lynn and Jackson Brown played, and it was all to raise money for the charity. I wanted to thank you, Marco, also. I know that I understand you donated. That was really nice of you. Oh, I did. Absolutely. My pleasure. And I was going to touch on that, that uh, anyone can can help by uh, visiting the website and, and donating online. And, and it's run by, by really great people and you do really great work. So it was it was really a pleasure to, to be part of it. Thanks, Marco. Final question. It's uh, fairly broad, but do you have any final words of advice for anyone aspiring to make a career in music? Wow. Well, yeah, you've got to love it. Don't do it. Don't do it for the fame. Don't do it because you want to be a rock star. Do it because you have to do it, and you would do it even if you didn't make a lot of money doing it. And do it because you love it, you know. And if you do that, it's going to be good, you know. And you'll be happy whether you make money or not. And nowadays, you know, it's it's rough out there for bands because people don't buy records as much and this and that. So you've got to really be dedicated, you know, to chase that dream. But if you love it, then you'll be fine, you know. <laughs> Mike, I, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time. I sincerely appreciate it. I appreciate your questions. It was a great interview. You asked a lot of deeper questions than I usually get. I appreciate the songwriting stuff. That was really enlightening. Thank you very, very much. Okay, good luck to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mike as much as I did. Until next time.